Hi, I'm Spencer Christian. On this episode of Tracks Ahead, we'll ride one of the East Coast's premier tourist lines. Check out a Northern Illinois LGB garden layout that basically puts itself away after being run. Plus, we'll discover who done it on a murder mystery train. But first, a visit to Oregon to explore an incredible F-gauge layout that uses sight, sound, and props to showcase the beauty of a Colorado narrow gauge. Let's get started. Tom Miller has had a lot of interest in his lifetime, but one overriding hobby has been trains. And in the early 70s, his father got him started in a big way. My father was a tool and die maker. I had a friend that worked at Lockheed that had a live steam locomotive. They ran at Griffith Park, so I went to Griffith Park. I saw the live steam. Uh, my dad, fortunately, being a tool and die maker, was capable of building one and teaching me to build one. So we built our first little engines, 040. We ran that uh, at Griffith Park for a, a while, and then it, it just sort of escalated from there. Going up into big boys, K36s, building my own railroad. It got uh, way out of hand. When Tom settled in Oregon, he decided he wanted his own seven and a half inch gauge railroad. So I built uh, this track. It's 11,000 feet of track. Uh, 7,500 7, feet of it is on the main line. I have about uh, 60 or 70 freight cars I built, uh, three steam locomotives, a couple of diesels. Uh, it's, it's become a big project. The railroad uh, features a 400 foot long trestle, a 300 foot long tunnel. So it's, a, it's a pretty spectacular setup. I have two really spectacular steam locomotives. One's the big boy in uh, inch and a half scale, and I have a two and a half inch scale K36. I built the K36 with a friend of mine, and the big boy was built in England by Severn Lamb. The big boy um, has a stainless steel boiler, one of the few in the steam locomotives in the country that has a stainless boiler. It has two working cross compound air compressors, put out about 140 pounds of air. It has working sanders, uh, air operated bell, working power reverse. I mean, it's everything on it is uh, just like the real thing. The K36 was an effort I tried uh, on my own because I wanted to see if I could match the quality of Severn Lamb. And uh, I started the K36. A friend of mine, Bart Pond, got involved, who's an excellent machinist. And the two of us built two K36s that turned out just fabulous. Tom had American Flyer as a child, and so it stands to reason that he would have a layout. My American Flyer layout is something I've dreamt of having my whole life. Uh, I started with Flyer when I was a kid at five years old. Uh, had to circle a track, couple of trains, that was about it. Spent my time going through catalogs wishing I had everything. Now that I have the means to buy this stuff, I end up going on eBay, getting everything. And now that it's finished, my grandkids and my friends bring their grandkids in here and the kids just love it. Uh, it's buttons to push, things happen, things you know go, things, you know, accessories work. And most of the time, by the time they played with it for a half an hour, they look around at their parents and go, why don't we have this? So uh, it's, it's, it's really fun to watch kids enjoy it. Tom wanted more, something to work on in the winter months. The results are housed inside this replica of an 1890s depot. The main attraction is an amazing F-scale layout. F-scale came about, uh, it's a fairly new, uh, new thing to the hobby. It's the same size same gauge track as G-scale. The difference is these locomotives are scaled from the track up. So they're perfectly scaled to the track where most G-scale locomotives are not. They're either too big or too small to be exactly right. And uh, being a perfectionist, I wanted exactly right. Tom wanted to model a region that would showcase the trains. Colorado narrow gauge has always been uh, one of my favorites. I've liked mainline steam in the past, but when you start looking into narrow gauge and what it took to build those railroads and, and how they helped build America and the, everything about them, it's just uh, they're, they're quirky locomotives, the cars, the equipment, everything is, is odd and quirky, and it's just very interesting to model. In many respects, Tom didn't take the normal approach to building the layout. I had never built a, a detailed indoor layout like this, and by contacting some uh, people in the hobby and, and local uh, modelers, uh, they started teaching me how to do it and talking to me about how to do it. And it became obvious to me, at least the way I like to run trains, is that I treated it more like theater. I wanted uh, very nice lighting. I wanted the scenes, I want the trains to run in and out of scenes as though they were actors playing, uh, playing a part in a role and coming and going from the stage. This project took a total of about five and a half years. Uh, I started building the buildings. They took about a year in themselves. The thing that made this the, the easiest to build for a layout this size is the mountains and the scenery and the rocks that go into the mountains. 
this is a product made by Bragdon Enterprises, and it's a foam product called geodesic foam. And it allows you to cast uh, rock castings from molds, very highly detailed molds, and getting detail you can't get in plaster. And they are, it is so lightweight that you can have molds that are, in, in this case, some of our molds were four feet square. Uh, so you can pour this plastic material in, and as it starts to harden, you can peel it out of the mold, and you're holding a rock that's you know, four feet square that weighs maybe two pounds. All the trees you see were handmade. There's about 4,000 trees in here. And frankly, that's one of the reasons I modeled this Chama, New Mexico area, is there aren't a lot of trees. The layout this size, if you model the Northwest, could easily have 20,000 trees in it. And um, I certainly wasn't up to building 20,000 trees. Well, one of the most satisfying things for me in building this layout was finding out I had some artistic talent. I, I really can't draw a straight line. And uh, to come in here and, and do this and design the scenery as we did and to plant the trees and the bushes and the rocks and design the hills and the mountains and the track line and have it turn out like this is probably uh, the most pleasing thing for me on the whole layout. I, I, I really never knew I had this sort of talent. One of the special features takes the layout from day to night and back again. Th this lighting system is, uh, was designed by a, a, a local gentleman who put it in a club layout in Portland. We took that design and with his help we, we massaged the system and I ended up having to build these light fixtures myself because I couldn't find them to be the proper design. We spent about three months in a hydraulic hoist up in the air wiring and installing this entire lighting system and it was done before anything was in here. We had to be able to get up to the ceiling to wire this thing. So basically it runs a 24 hour light cycle and we do it in about, we find to be about 40 minutes is about right. So uh, for about 20 minutes it fades slowly down to midnight. It stays there for a short time and then slowly fades back up uh, to noon again. The sound systems uh, came from uh, a fellow that uh, has a company called Fanasonics and he basically makes uh, SD cards that have sound effects on them. Uh, sawmills, stamp mills, rivers, running water, you name it. And what he did for me was to come here and we installed all the, the sound uh, devices and the speakers in the buildings and around the room and then he custom recorded uh, different sound effects for me. So we, each, each one of my structures has its own individual sound effect. Does Tom have any favorite spots along the line? I would have to say the stamp mill. It's fully animated when you look inside. The belts are turning, the stamps go up and down, the, the grizzlies are turning, the shaker tables, everything works. So it's, it's one of my favorite spots on the layout. We have a lot of things in here that were uh, very highly detailed. I wanted th certain things to be accurate. And in this scale, uh, it's very close to one inch dollhouse equipment. So all, most, almost all of these structures have interior details and lighting. The computer controls the lighting along with the, the ambient light. Um, we put all the detail in them we could. Uh, we, we tried to put a little humor in here and there. Gibson Diner, our dog's name was Gibson. We have the Wigwam Lodge, which is called Sweet Sue's uh, Wigwam Lodge. My wife's name is Sue, so we named it after her. There's a few little things like that around here. Tom's passion for railroading is certainly clear, and we are very glad to have seen his accomplishments. Coming up, themed rides for tourist line trips always make for a memorable run on the rails. The Kempton, Wanamaker and Southern Railroad does a great job of keeping everyone guessing on its murder mystery tour. But next, an Illinois LGB layout that features pretty much everything you'd expect in a garden setup, including miniature plantings. But one feature surely makes life easy for this owner when it comes time to put it all to bed. It is the Chicago suburb of Elgin that we visit a garden railroad. It's here where Jim Snork and his fellow Garden Railway club members have built an empire. Of course, for Jim, it all started at an early age. I started with uh, my first set when I was probably uh, five or six, you know, the good old 50s with the Lionel. Later in life, Jim developed a taste for larger trains. It was, again, a starter set uh, from LGB that I ran around the Christmas tree, one of these Marshall Field specials, and then I went to a train show and the train club that I'm now in was there with a, a floor display. I said, this is cool, I want to expand. So I started with the train club and 
One thing leads to another. Before you know it, you got an empire. Jim started with the computer design. Working around the house and other fixed items on the lot, he knew that water features make a garden railroad much more interesting. We started building this in uh, uh, 2010 in fall with the water feature. Came back and actually started getting the road bed in for the lot because I already had it done on the computer. The lines meander around the garden with plenty to see along the way. When you start out of the yard, you go under a couple of uh, uh, bridges, foot bridges, pedestrian bridges that uh, I incorporated in the, the layout. Uh, and then as you keep going around the outer loop, uh, there's a, a switching section out there to bring you in or out of the outer loop uh, into that mountain loop or stay on the outer loop. And then you go past that around and you come in past the, uh, well, there's a, a, a couple of villages out there that you go past, the, the uh, bird feeder village, and then there's a, a village of uh, ferry type buildings on the far side of the mountain. And then there's the wooden house building on the north end of the layout as you're coming around. Make the loop around there and you get onto the big bridge. And the big bridge is a model left of the Golden Gate, but I call it, it's painted red, so I call it my Scarlet Gate Bridge. And uh, comes back through the yard and you can come around. The fourth line is a, is a trolley line that can run up to four trolleys independently. They are, again, all signal blocked with uh, the ability of two trolleys and stations at either end and the two passing in the middle with a passing siding. They come into the stations and they stop and the other two take off. All automatically using the LGB EPL system. Jim had extra help from fellow club members during the early stages of the construction. We actually came out and did a little bit of surveying. Uh, most of that took place when we were having the uh, pond company out to dig the pond and we had them laser everything to work out the grades. Uh, we kind of drove them crazy with, we needed this rock here and that one there, and they had to kind of fudge with us and make things fit in, and they helped actually lay the tunnel piping because um, they had the, the big cat and stuff here that they could cover things over easier. Jim's focus is on the trains and on their operation. He knew his shortcomings when it came to the gardening part. I I'm not fussy about plantings other than let them grow. You know, um, if you ask me what I have out there, I couldn't really tell you because I don't know. I buy them and I like them and they grow. That's where the help of club member Leona Rush was so valuable. Jim had purchased how many of those? hundred uh, miniature uh, Japanese pine trees and he didn't know what, really where he wanted them. He knew he wanted a forest because he had log cars and he wanted to make a logging camp. Um, then he said he wanted a little more green, so I brought some hostas and some of the sedum, different kinds of sedum, so that they would bloom at different times and in different colors. Jim's railroad has a very special feature, one that makes his life so much easier. The one special feature that I like is the fact that I we knocked a hole in the wall of the garage and we bring trains right in, park them on sidings, and not have to take anything off the track and put them in boxes. It just stays on the track. Uh, I want to come out and run trains. I just open the doors, pull the train out, and away I go. The owner rush can easily sum up the appeal of garden railroading. Trains and gardens, sometimes, some people think it's an odd mixture. And in my neighborhood, I know that they felt that um, that was kind of an unusual hobby. But I felt that trains and gardens go together well because it's like a moving sculpture in and out of the uh, planting of the garden. They go into a tunnel and then reappear to surprise the viewer of the garden. Jim Snork and his friends have indeed created a work of art in his backyard. Gumshoes gather at the Kempton train station in Pennsylvania to solve a mysterious murder. And when my reinforcements get here, you're all going to jail. <laughs> Good day, citizens. On the Wanamaker, Kempton, and Southern Railroad, or the WKS, riders take on new identities as they try to solve this mobile murder mystery. 
You, sir, are a member of the Chipmunk Chess Club. <laughs> it's called The Great Moonshine Mystery, and it's an interactive murder mystery that takes place on the train. Every year, longtime volunteer Oliver Blatt shows off his creative side when he writes and directs a new play just for the train. He says it gives writers a unique experience they can't find anywhere else. I think this is probably the only place that I know of where the show is completely interactive on a train. What will happen is as guests arrive here, we ask them to forget their identities. Everyone in the show gets to take part in the show. They all have new names. You are going to be a part of the O'Reilly clan. Okay. And you are also going to be a part of the O'Reilly clan. Some people have lines to say. Don't worry, I'll protect you with my strong, manly arms. <laughs> some people get to sing, some people get to stand up and read poems. We like to play games, especially with you. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. The railroad got its start in the late 1800s by shipping Pennsylvania coal to Delaware. But by the 1960s, the trains were being used less and less. So in 1962, a group of investors decided to buy some of the track and form a tourist railroad. Today, the investors are the hobbyists and volunteers who run the trains. Jim Krause is the general manager of operations at the WK&S. He and his fellow train lovers are on a mission to make sure that the trains stay open for everyone in the community to enjoy. In 1963, the original investors started it as a, an amusement park, essentially, a, an entertainment facility. They actually sold stock, and you can still buy stock in this railroad. Now, is it something you're going to trade publicly in New York? No. But um, you can buy stock now, and that was simply to build up capital. The whole show lasts about an hour and a half. And along the way, riders meet a few interesting characters. Nigel, keep talking. <laughs> now, where's the shot? Like Officer Justice. The shot. Granny. She might be as dumb as a box of rocks, but she is kin. All right. You best take good care of her, all right. Billy Bob. At least we don't have to worry about Detective Brassbach taking us all to death when she's not on this train tonight. You look really good. And Lurleen. <laughs> Still, there's more than one secret on this whodunit ride. But this is a moonshine mystery, so we will stop the train. We'll stop at the secret still site along the tracks tonight. Uh, so we will find the moonshine tonight. But we, but it's up to the audience to figure out who done it. I thought I heard a noise. Oh, it's probably the little people having an argument in your head. Now let's go. No, but a lot goes into bringing this mystery to life year after year. Everyone here is a volunteer. That means that all the proceeds from the show go right back into the trains. We find things that the community seems to like. We ran our murder mystery train last night. The community loves that. That's what we do. We have the, the Christmas trip. We have our Harvest Moon trip. That sells out. We now have a wine and cheese train that sells out every year. We have our annual Kids Fun Weekend. We try to maintain ticket prices at, at something that the community can afford. Not everything is about the dollar. Though the annual murder mystery is just one of the special events hosted by the WK&S, each ride offers guests a fun way to enjoy this historic railroad. But it's the murder mystery that keeps citizen sleuths like these coming back every summer. We hope that they have a good time. We hope that they can forget about their troubles for a few hours and just get into another world that we've created for them. We can find where Lurleen put that shine on the train. That's bad. And with these lively characters, it's easy to leave your worries on the platform. Hi, I'm Dave Ball. We've always loved to feature unique stories about trains, layout owners, travel destinations, and tourist lines. But the segments that demonstrate a love for railroading history, especially in the face of adversity, always mean the most to me. That's the premise behind our next classic tracks piece. Now, keeping a tourist train in operation for 140 years is quite the challenge, but bringing one back from near total destruction, like the Wilmington and Western, well, that takes real dedication. Traveling through a lush and gentle landscape is a vintage railroad born of the Industrial Revolution, a time of booming business in this Delaware Valley. While the industries have faded, the scenery remains, and today the journey is taken purely for pleasure. 
The Wilmington and Western Railroad is located just outside of Wilmington, Delaware, close to the Pennsylvania border. The railroad was built in the late 19th century to service the water-powered mills that lined the Red Clay Creek. There were grain mills, snuff mills, uh, rolling mills, and um, the railroad saw an opportunity to service these mills on their way to Landenburg, Pennsylvania. Today, the Green Bank Mill still stands as a living history museum. One of the early mill owners along the creek was named DuPont, a family that grew to prominence in the area and continues to have an impact on the railroad. There are several DuPont estates that are uh, peppered throughout the valley, and the railroad will actually cross two of those private estates. All aboard! Since 1966, visitors have been eagerly boarding the train with their picnic fare for the daily 10-mile trip from Green Bank Station to Mount Cuba, following the Red Clay Creek along the way. The unique portion of this valley is, is that it's a, it's a location where the Piedmont and the, uh, the coastal plain kind of come together. And you'll see that as we uh, ride up the line. There we will cross over the river several times. We will go through some serious, very serious rock cuts that the railroad had to blast out in order to get through there. The railroad line follows the Red Clay Creek, so we will snake back and forth and meander to the left and to the right and to the left just to get to Mount Cuba. And once we get to Mount Cuba, again, it's on this private estate. It's very quiet and peaceful, and we operate this small picnic grove right next to the river. A picnic by the train is a tradition dating back to the 1890s when the railroad brought city dwellers here for a day in the country or a visit to nearby Brandywine Springs, a Victorian amusement park that closed in 1923. Today, with the help of 80 volunteers, the railroad operates close to 400 excursions year-round, including a variety of seasonal events. The flagship of the Wilmington and Western is steam engine number 98, built in 1909 by the American Locomotive Company. The 98 is, um, has just recently undergone a, an arrest, a restoration, a lot of boiler work at a cost of a half a million dollars. And the 98 is, is one of the reasons I think a lot of rail fans and people do come to see us. It's one of the few American class locomotives operating in the United States today. Another gem in the collection is this self-propelled doodle bug built by Pullman Standard in 1929 was operated in, in Pennsylvania, not too far from here. We um, acquired the machine in, I believe it was the late 80s, and um, had it restored uh, through a grant from the Revere Cookware Corporation, and that's why it's now called the Paul Revere, number 4662. Throughout its history, the railroad has depended on its close proximity to the Red Clay Creek. But in recent years, that relationship was put to the test when the railroad was struck by not one, but two natural disasters. The first in 1999, when Hurricane Floyd tore through the Red Clay Valley, flooding the area. Matter of fact, the location that we're standing in was probably underwater by as, as tall as we are. Um, it wiped out two of our, our wooden trestle bridges and um, twisted and bent four others. It took a year and a half to repair the bridges and restore service, but the railroad managed to survive its worst disaster, or so they thought. Four years later, almost to the day, Tropical Storm Henri stalled over the Red Clay Creek, sending 12 feet of water rushing down the valley. What happened in 99 was, a, was an afternoon rainstorm compared to Henri. The floodwaters took out six bridges and miles of roadbed, but thanks in part to David's intense fundraising, the railroad slowly recovered. It took four long years to rebuild, but today the bridges are state of the art. The new bridges are actually drilled into the earth. There were rock sockets drilled in sometimes as much as nine feet into the bedrock and, and concrete columns then poured with steel reinforcing bars from, from the bottom of the bedrock. Today, Mount Cuba is once again a perfect spot for celebrating and relaxing, where kids young and not so young can enjoy a picnic along a peaceful waterfront with the train, as always, nearby. This railroad is, is, a, is a, a unique gem for the state of Delaware and for the surrounding community. The train has indeed become a treasured part of this community. The mere sight of it is cause for celebration. Its dramatic story of survival adds yet another layer of history to the Wilmington and Western experience. 
the scenery, the right of way, the beauty of what you're, we're traveling through is, is unmatched in, in many tourist lines. It's, it's a magnificent right of way. The scenery that one experiences from looking out the windows of the Wilmington and Western teems with American history. Over 100 years of railroading in the cradle of the Revolutionary War makes this quite the memorable trip. Well, that's all for this episode. Please join us next time for more Tracks Ahead. Thank you.